The Lord be with you. Merry Christmas. <laughs> nice to see you all. Welcome, welcome. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes before we get into the rest of our worship. Um, I do know this is not about me, but I've been encouraged just to introduce myself for some of you maybe just kind of coming in and visiting and that kind of thing. So uh, my name is Pastor Jay Jackson. I've uh, been called as of May to be the new pastor here. So I'm very honored and humbled to be a part of uh, this worship community. And it's been a great three services thus far. <laughs> Looking forward to the final one. It's nice. But um, I do want to say thank you in advance for uh, Ryan and the, the whole uh, crew that has really put in a lot of work work over the last couple of months uh, to get all of this ready to go. And there's just a lot of a lot of workings behind the scenes that you don't realize has really happened. So we do want to say openly thank you to them for that. Um, all right. Yes, I'm still nervous. Um, okay, quick word about communion. We'll touch base on that during the announcement piece. But we are um, going to be doing it via intention, and I'll explain that here momentarily. Uh, but it is an open communion. So if you believe that Jesus Christ is present with us in the bread and the wine, uh, you are welcome to come forward and do that. So we want to make sure we, uh, we say that very clearly. And then we will also be pro probably dealing with fire this evening in some way, shape, or form. So the exits are there and there and there if need be, which we haven't yet, but there's always a first. So, um, and then we will go ahead and pass out for kids who are under 10, uh, such as my own, that will have battery-operated candles. So we've, we should be able to handle those out to, to them that are here as well. So... That is all I have in the way of announcements. We're very excited to have you all here. If you're visiting with us, we're, we're very excited as well. So at this point, we're going to invite you to stand. We're going to begin with our processional hymn, O Come All Ye Faithful. Welcome to worship.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, because you became a babe, we can pray to you and know that God in heaven hears us. As a babe, you are Emmanuel, God with us, God in our place. For this, we most heartily thank you. For now we know that God of all love, the God who has drawn close to us, that we might draw close to him. How wonderfully you came to take away all of our fears and doubts. You came as a babe, helpless to be our help. You came as a babe, humble to remove our pride. You came as a babe, lowly, so that we might be lifted up to you. You came as a babe, pure, so that you might take upon yourself our sin. Help us, Lord, to know you always as you are, so that we need no longer seek far and wide, high and low, to find God. Fill us with your Spirit, and bring us again to kneel at your manger, there to confess, my Lord and my God. Amen. I say you remain standing for the reading of our Christmas Gospel. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the entire inhabited earth should be taxed. This taxation was first made when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own city to be taxed. So Joseph also departed from the city of Nazareth in Galilee to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, in Judea, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So while they were there, the day came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in strips of cloth and lied him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And in the same area there were shepherds living in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were very afraid. But the angel said to them, Listen, do not fear, for I bring you good news of great joy which will be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the angel a company of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came hurrying and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they made widely known the word which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at what the shepherds told them. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. (laughs) Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus, our Christ. Amen. There's a book out there that's been out for a little while. It's not the Bible. It's that one. What to expect when you're expecting. Familiar with it? Anyone? Slightly? A little bit? Okay. And by a while, I mean, I really think it's been out for about 25 years or so. And I know because my wife, I believe, had a copy of this book with our oldest daughter, who is now 24. So we know there's at least a little bit of a, uh, of a range there. But the premise is simple for these kind of books. Put together a list of uh, typical things, let's say, that a, a pregnant or soon-to-be mom would hope to experience during their time of expectancy. It's what we might call a best practice list for pregnancy. And it was very helpful in my wife's getting ready for our first child and the child children after that as well um, that were going to be born. And it might have actually been beneficial to me had I read it, which she encouraged me to do. But I didn't, so that's okay. Um, But that's what we men like to call hindsight. Um, But what to expect when you're expecting was extremely popular, wildly popular even, because it helped to prepare a generation of women and still is helping um, on what they might experience during this time of childbirth. Of course, like anything that's successful, it spawned a few other what to expect kind of books. So what to expect the first year, and then the second year, and what to expect the toddler years. You kind of get the idea. So we are uh, still expecting though, we're waiting for that what to expect the teen years, (laughs) because that would be very beneficial these days. Um, But I'm not sure there's actually an expectation for teens and teen living. But the whole point of this kind of introduction is expectations drive our lives. 
Expectations, believe it or not, whether we acknowledge them or not, are a driving force in how we experience things. And so like pregnancy, Christmas Eve or the Christmas season is full of expectations. Some are realistic, some are not so realistic. But our worship service even is full of expectations, right? There's an expectation that at the end of this worship service, we're going to dim the lights, we're going to light some candles, and we're going to go ahead and sing Silent Night, right? It is an almost magical conclusion to our Christmas Eve service. And it sets the mood for the rest of our our Christmas celebration, if you will. So the expectation is there. But what if I told you we're going to collect all your candles and we're not going to have that this evening? What would your reaction be? Bummer. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) they heard it last week. But no, what would your reaction be, right? There probably would be a reaction, right? And of course, I know what the reaction would be initially. It would probably be my very first and my very last Christmas service here at Trinity if we got rid of that. But we're not going to. But I really wanted to make the point. I really wanted to, to stress this, that there is an expectation that that's going to happen. So when there is an expectation of something happening and it doesn't happen, or maybe it doesn't happen the way we expect it to, what do we do then, right? It feels like there's a sense of bummer, if you will, throughout the rest of that time, all right? But expectations drive much of our life. And so that also leads me to a little bit of a sidebar, which I alluded to earlier. For 95 years, there has been the expectation that an ordained member of the Austin family would be leading worship at Trinity, on Christmas, right? Now, it may have been unwritten and actually hadn't even thought about it that way until this year when there's somebody new leading worship, right? That was an expectation, a very solid, something you could count on every time that there would be an Austin either in the pulpit or leading worship, right? There had always been that here. So if you're new to our community, it's a big part of our history of who we are at Trinity, right? And if you've been a part of our worship community and you're just returning, it might feel a little bit different than what you'd experienced in the past. Seeing someone other than a member of the Austin family leading us through our Christmas worship. All right? There may be even some of you will walk away this evening going, no, that just didn't feel normal. Didn't feel like what we were used to. It may feel a little bit different because there's some new guy up there now leading the worship service. All right? And maybe it just won't feel like it always has. And that's okay. It's not going to feel the same because the players have changed, so to speak. But what is the same is the message. The message will be the same. The gospel is unchanged. That's going to happen too. There's just a new voice proclaiming it, that's all. And it takes some getting used to, and that's understandable. But the underlying emphasis is this. Expectations tend to drive the thinking in our lives. So what are our expectations for Christmas? For our kids, for our grandkids. Well, of course, they vary from person to person. They vary from family to family. But this time of year, expectations are high. I know, because I'm living it. We have a couple boys that we adopted last year. We are trying to create new and fantastic experiences for them, traditions that they'll be able to latch on to and pass on to their kids, like our kids would experience as well. Because we want our kids to have those great memories forever. Right? You ever wonder why we love the Griswolds so much? Right? It's that push for the perfect Christmas. Clark Griswold reading the night before Christmas to his family around a tree that doesn't have any more needles. I mean, the excessive amount of lights he puts on the house. It's all because he's trying to get them to have the perfect Christmas. He wants them to experience and have those expectations. And we love that movie so much because there's so much of it we can relate to, right? So much of that is true. Even if we don't go above and beyond what he does, we can still relate to that, that feeling. We have these Norman Rockwell expectations for Christmas. Snow, crackling fire, peace and harmony, and all we get is rain. <laughs> lots and lots of rain. Right? So what we expect isn't always what we get. So what do you do with that? We got a couple visual explanations of what is an expectation versus reality. All right? On the left, your expectation is, you know, simple little lights, cute little pug look in your face. The reality is your child hates snowmen. All right. It's kind of a fun one. The next one is, is just as cute, right? The expectations, loving lights, chewing on them unhealthily like. But the reality is they're a little freaked out by the big bulbs. But 
So we understand there are expectations and there are realities, right? And so just to ensure we're all on the same page when it comes to expectations, here's the definition we're going to work with. An expectation is simply a strong belief that something will happen or be the case in the future, all right? It's simply a strong belief that something will happen or that will be the case in the future. And so the question for tonight is, what happens when our expectations are greater than the results, all right? You've probably heard that saying, lower your expectations and you won't be disappointed, right? A lot of us had to live with that daily. Um, But there's some truth to that, to be sure. But to walk around in life without any expectations is really, really boring. Yes, you won't have to deal with as much disappointment because you won't have those expectations. But because you didn't get what you expected, it's no way to walk around through life. It's a rather mundane, mundane way to go. Of course, it is helpful to have realistic expectations, but one thing is sure, expectations change as our context change. We grow, we mature. Things change as we move. For example, we're going to go back to motherhood again. We're going to add the layer of wife to that. So a wife and a mother, right? Put those two together. Um, What is the expectation of a wife and a mother these days? All right? Of course, it varies, right? We know those, it depends on our context, and our context change. And I have a perfect example of why we understand these change. I'm going to read to you the expectations of a wife in the (laughs) mid-1950s, right? (laughs) This is entitled, How to Be a Good Wife, and it was supposedly taken from a high school economics book in 1954, okay? This is what we taught in home ec. Ready? Number one, have dinner ready, okay? Number two, plan ahead, even the night before, to have a delicious meal on time. Number three, prepare yourself. Take 15 minutes to rest so that you'll be refreshed when he arrives. Number four, touch up your makeup. Put a ribbon in your hair and be fresh looking. Remember, he has been at work with a lot of weary people. (laughs) They get better. (laughs) Prepare the children. Yeah. Take a few minutes to wash their hands and faces. Comb their hair. And if necessary, change their clothes. Minimize all noise. At the time of his arrival, eliminate all noise of the washer, the dryer, the dishwasher, or the vacuum. Try to encourage the children to be quiet. Now, some don'ts as well. Don't greet him with problems or complaints. Don't complain if he is late for dinner. Count this as minor compared to what he might have gone through for the day. Make him comfortable. Have a cool or warm drink ready for him. Listen to him. (laughs) <laughs> the 50s, <laughs> right? Now, we giggle a little, of course, but let's walk through that for just a minute. And I promise we're going to get to baby Jesus, I swear, that's why we're here. But I do want to hammer home how important expectations are, all right? Why they really, really matter. And so what I just shared, is that the expectation right now that, that society would have of a wife? Probably not, No. Is there even a strong belief that any of that is remotely true to what might happen when a wife or husband comes home? In most cases, no. However, understand this. As we look at family systems, and by family systems, the the people that have raised us, it doesn't have to be mom and dad kind of thing, but our environments that nurtured us, that basically gave us the models that we now move on with our lives, right? So as we look at family systems, there are children in this worship space. And by children, I mean adults that live through those expectations. Bless you. And if this is how you were raised, or if this is the relationship that was modeled for you as a child, then today's view on parenting, or marriage, or relationships may make you go, bummer. It may make you feel a little disconnected, right? Because that was your norm at one point. You kind of follow me there? It's not that our expectations are wrong, or they're too high. They just don't feel congruent with society. And so we adjust and we adapt and we try to make them fit to where we are. But all of that makes us feel a little bit more odd. And that's why we like those terms, the good old days, right? Because we liked that time because that's our comfort. So, okay. I think we kind of hammered the the point home about expectations. Now, baby Jesus time. All right. A little bit of background. Jesus was also born into a time that had plenty of expectations. All right. Jesus was Jewish. Jewish. And he was born from a people in Israel. So they had an expectation that one day they would be freed from their captivity. 
If you remember at the time, they were currently under the rule of the Roman Empire, and because the empire liked things nice and orderly, this is why we hear Mary and Joseph having to travel to Bethlehem to be counted. And what that meant was the Roman Empire wanted to know how many people they had under their control at any given time. And so they would take censuses. All right? And so it was expected that all people, no matter where they were at, would eventually gravitate to their own hometowns and be registered. So we could count on where they were. All right? But the Jewish people had been under occupation for thousands of years. They had a history, really more history of being occupied than unoccupied. Egyptians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Romans, you name it, they've been conquered. All of them had their hand in the oppression of the Israel people throughout history. And so they were promised through their scriptures that a Messiah would eventually free them from this oppression. One of the best examples we have is in Micah 2. The book of Micah in the Old Testament, it holds one of these promises. And it begins in verse 12, it reads this. I will surely gather all of you, Jacob, I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I will bring them together like sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture. The place will throng with people. The one who breaks open the way will go up before them. That's the Messiah they're talking about. All right? Their king will pass through before them, the Lord at their head. All right? They have plenty, the Israelite people had plenty of passages in their scriptures that promised this Messiah, that promised them a king. I mean, we even hear it in the references in the gospel that Ben wrote about the Messiah. Today in the city of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. All right? The angels proclaimed that one themselves. So there was no doubt this is the Messiah. But is it the Messiah that the people of Israel were expecting? Was it the one they were really, really waiting for? Because the expectations for a Messiah were high. There were expectations this Messiah would overthrow the ones who were occupying the Israel people and would lead them back to that glory days that they hadn't seen really even before. They were looking for a military leader, one who would lead them from their suffering back into the dominant and powerful people they once were. Their hopes for a Messiah were to reclaim that kingdom for the people. That was their hope for a vision and a savior. The Orthodox Jewish believers are still waiting for that Messiah to come, right? They're still waiting for the Messiah to come back to reign on earth. Now, we understand that Jesus was, when he was born, that he came to dwell among us and to walk with us and ultimately go to the cross for us. His kingdom was not earthly. So we understand that. That was his version, the Messiah. His kingdom did not overthrow the governments. His kingdom is different. But it's not what the people of Israel were expecting. And yet God did deliver on his promise. God has given us the Messiah through his son. One that's going to free us from the bondage that keeps us down. One that's already risen from the grave and conquered death and assures us that when we believe and have faith and follow him, we can expect to have our place in his kingdom as well. But if our expectation of that doesn't match our reality, then this Jesus may not make much of a difference in our own lives. Because we have expectations for Jesus too. What's different is that we already know that because of his death and resurrection, he has fulfilled the expectations that he came for. He came to save us from the death and the grave. And his kingdom that we are all living in will be everlasting. His promises have remained true. His promises have been fulfilled. So maybe our expectations are just a little bit disconnected. You see, we all still kind of want that comfort here on earth. We still want freedom from those things that oppress us. Sometimes it's all on how we look at expectations that we have for ourselves. There's a a very interesting cartoon that shows a fourth grade teacher kind of standing head face to face with each other, right? Like this. And on on the wall back here on the chalkboard is a bunch of unfinished math problems. So you can just imagine how the conversation went. And then there's this big bubble up there and it says, I'm not an underachiever, you're an over-expector. All right? <laughs> Teachers out there going, uh-huh, yep. But maybe some of us are over-expectors. All right? Maybe some of us want Jesus to take care of our lives here on earth and we expect good things because we believe in him. Well, good things can happen to us. Many times do happen to us. But that's not always what we should expect. 
the biggest expectation that we do have of Jesus is that no matter what does come through our lives, he will be there to walk through it with us. That is one expectation we can have. And so if you happen to be here tonight through the invitation of a friend or a family member, or you just wandered in for a place to find baby Jesus, you're here for one reason, Jesus Christ. You're here to experience the same thing that the shepherds experienced as they heard the news proclaimed of a Savior that was being born. You're here for the hope that Jesus Christ provides and will always provide for us, for each and every one of us. Yes, the music is great. Actually, above great. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. So we want to enjoy it. The candlelight will be magical. So in case you're still stuck on that first part where I said we're not doing it, we are doing it. All right? The candlelight's going to be awesome. Take it all in. The time together that we're spending is edifying. It's fantastic. It's very important. The decorations are festive. The Alder Guild does a great job in getting us ready for the season. But none of that is why we are here tonight. Right? It all is great. There is a lot of work that goes behind it, so we want to lift it up. But we could do this in a shed, too. Because none of this really matters. All the pomp and circumstances. Because we're only in this place, in this time, because of one thing. Hope. Hope is the expectation that something outside of ourselves, something or someone external, is going to come to our rescue and we will live happily ever after. Isn't that a great definition of hope? Hope is the expectation that something outside of ourselves, meaning something or someone external, is going to come to our rescue and we will live happily ever after. The question is, do we think we really need rescuing? But hope is why we are here tonight. Hope is why we gather together on Sundays, or any other time for that matter, in the name of Jesus Christ. Hope is the reason that we're going to go out after this service and tell others about our risen Savior and King. Because we want all people to have that same feeling, that same secure feeling of hope that we have right now. It's that feeling that because we are saved and because we believe and we trust in the one who was born in a manger and died on that cross, that we have the expectation that we will live forever with him. That expectation, that promise has already been fulfilled. It has already been met in the life and death of this little baby child. So if you do find yourself with us tonight, we're glad you're here. Maybe if you find yourself a little overwhelmed by the one who really came to save us, that would be normal too. Because this Messiah Jesus, the one that we know, challenges us. See, it's now our time to go out and proclaim as the shepherds did. To go out and seek this child. To go tell it on the mountain. To shout for joy to the world. Because we know that his expectation for us is not to keep this good news to ourselves. So, expectations are important. They guide our lives whether we like to admit it or not. But there are some expectations that are a little bit more important than others. Some expectations carry future and hope, and joy, and promise. And the difference with these expectations that we have with Jesus is that he's already lived up to those expectations and promises us that we can count on them with the hope of a Messiah who does reign from on high. So I'd encourage us not to lower our expectations. As a matter of fact, we ought to raise them. Raise them up higher than they have ever been. Because we have the hope of living forever with the one who died on a cross for us, who rose from the grave for us. And it's the same baby Jesus that is born to us this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Amen.
the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Almighty God, you subverted all expectations when you entered this world as a lowly baby that first Christmas Eve. In so doing, you showed the world that your ways are not our ways and your thoughts are not our thoughts. Nevertheless, by this Christ child's immaculate conception, virgin birth, holy life, sacrificial death, and victorious resurrection, we give you thanks and praise that your story has now become our story, that by the waters of baptism and faith in the promise, we are now your children. Abide in us, Lord, and by your Holy Spirit, enable us to abide in you, that we may be filled with joy and proclaim your glad tidings to all people. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, in the taking on of flesh, your Son united himself to the family of Mary and Joseph. We ask that you would bless the families of this congregation, our communities, our nation, and the world. That men and women would live together faithfully as husbands and wives, and that children would be taught and nurtured with the love and grace of your word. May your church be a refuge for the weary, a family for the lonely, and a support for all who are burdened. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask for your hand of protection upon all of our servicemen and women, all of our police, our firefighters, first responders, and all those whose service has called them away from their loved ones this Christmas. Protect all who are traveling during this holiday time and lead us all to a safer and more blessed year ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace and peace, we pray especially for all who are experiencing their first Christmas without a loved one. Comfort all who grieve as they reflect on Christmas's past that were spent together. We lift up especially the families of Christine Dean, Lorraine Schaefer, George Lohr, and Margaret Lemon, whom you have called home to spend Christmas with you now and forevermore. Grant all those who mourn the hope of that glorious day when we will all know what it is to have everlasting Emmanuel, God with us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And merciful healer, we pray now for those among us in these pews or in our hearts who are in need of your healing presence. We lift up all those who are listed on our prayer chains and in our bulletins, and all those whose names we now mention either silently or out loud before you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, the King of kings, the newborn baby. Amen. Amen. Now, my friends, the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us share that peace one with another now.
We uh, invite you to be seated. We do want to share with you a couple of quick announcements as far as uh, what we'll be doing this evening. So we will be receiving communion. Again, we mentioned this is an open communion. So for, for us, that is what we'd like to do and share with you. Um, you will be doing it via intinction. So this evening, as you receive a wafer, hang on to it, even though your natural reaction would be to pop it in. Um, hang on to that, and then you'll have a deacon next to you as well that will also be offered there to dip. So um, as you choose, it's up to you that's still valid either way that, that you're able to do that. So we want to offer that to you. Um, and then as far as going home this evening, just be careful. We, uh, we're glad you're here. If you uh, see those connection slips in your, in your uh, bulletin and you happen to be a visitor or you'd like to, to fill one of those out for us, we'd love to see where you're at and, and uh, how we could reach out to you from that standpoint too. So that is where we have in the way of announcements. Yay. Let's get back to worship, shall we? Very good. I invite you to stand as we have our prayer of confession. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks. We give you thanks for the gift of your mercy. And as we know, we we do confess to you. We don't like it, but we've turned from you. We've given ourselves into the power of sin. And for that, we humbly repent. We are sorry. And this time, as we come to you, we give you thanks for the grace and the mercy that you do give to us. We ask that you forgive our sins, those that are known and those that we've left unknown things that we've done and things that we've left undone. Uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in the newness of life. All these things we ask in your merciful son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, it was in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord and Savior Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Please come and eat. I invite you to be seated.
Please stand. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen us all and keep us forever in his grace. Amen. O oh God, we give you thanks that you have set before us this feast, the body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I was going to say, at this time, we're going to dim the lights, but they beat me to it. So um, at this time, we'll ask the deacons to come forward, as they'll be helping out with the lights, and we'll be passing out the battery lights for the kids. They'll be coming around. Let's invite you to be seated and get comfortable. There's a reason we do what we do, and as we do, we hear about the darkness. The darkness of the church represents the darkness of the world made so by sin. The candlelight is Christ, who is God's light to all the people in the darkness. The passing of the light is the way the gospel spreads. The brightness in the church is the way that Christ affects change in each one of us. The lifting of the candles heightens our realization of the glory of God in us, and the light for the candles comes from the Christ candle, which symbolizes Christ, the light of the world.
you're invited to stand as we sing Silent Night. of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Amen. Amen. You're encouraged to gently blow out your light. back. <laughs> and now may the Lord bless us and keep us this day. May the Lord's face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord look upon us with his favor and give us all his peace.
Christmas. Thanks for watching. Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church can be found at 1100 Philadelphia Road in Joppa, Maryland and at trinityjoppa.org. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat. Be sure to check out the Facebook page for our Trinity Joppa YouTube channel and please consider supporting our Patreon at patreon.com slash trinityjoppa. God bless.